Okay, I think uh, it's time that we can get started. Okay. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome. And uh, we are so excited that uh, you are joining us this session on the Open Program Infrastructure Project. I think uh, it's my first time to introduce the Open Program Infrastructure Project here in Japan. And my name is Haidu Suyama. I'm Chief Architect Director. And I'm Aki Marus F5. Nice to meet you. So first of all, I'd like to uh, briefly introduce about what is the Open Program Infrastructure Project. Then we can spend time to discuss uh, uh, potential use case, how we can adapt that use case to the Open Program Infrastructure Project. I'd like to spend time to discuss with you guys about the uh, expected use case, okay? Open Program Infrastructure Project was established this summer together with F5, Red Hat, and Intel, and NVIDIA, and Marvel, and uh, Dell Technology, and Keysight. And we are now under the Linux Foundation project. And uh, here is the current member list. We are welcome to you guys to join the, the, uh, the member company or uh, individual contributor. We have, uh, there are many ways to contribute to Open Program Infrastructure project. What we are going to do now is that uh, as you know, that the uh, current uh, deployment model with uh, SmartNIC on the uh, Kubernetes, uh, it's still monolithic uh, deployment model. Uh, it's tight relationship with uh, KubePot and uh, uh, SmartNIC through the SRV. But we try to decouple the uh, resource well, for the main CPU resource organization, and the other is DPU and IPU resource management. We try to create the uh, infrastructure cluster for the DPU, IPU, while the uh, existing uh, cluster uh, running on the guest user's uh, tenant uh, workload on top of the x86 CPU. So challenge is that uh, how we can create the uh, common deployment model to deploy the network workload, storage workload, security workload into the DPU and IPU server. So we are trying to create a common API or more vendor agnostic way to eliminate the hardware and the software and the cloud vendor lock-in actually, yeah. So what we need uh, to adapt uh, with the uh, IBU DPU technology is here. Uh, I listed it here. So we try to eliminate the locking in the cloud vendor locking, hardware vendor locking, the software vendor locking. Especially, you know, you know that uh, many device vendor is now promoting that uh, DPU, my Marvel DPU and uh, uh, no, uh, NVIDIA DPU and Intel IPU. So. Uh, if we implement each DPU, we have to follow the, the vendor's uh, process, uh, procedure to deploy. So we try to eliminate that kind of the vendor locking uh, uh, interface, but uh, we try to create a common API that the each vendor agree to use that anyway. And also, uh, you know that the, uh, currently we're using the SRV type of the uh, workload on top of the Kubernetes. Uh, we can try to think about uh, how to migrate the data workload into the DPU IPU cell, okay? And also, yeah, with using that to manage the uh, uh, infrastructure acceleration functionality. And yeah, in order to do, we try to create the open API uh, for the uh, DPU and IPU deployment to manage the application and acceleration functionality. And also, uh, we try to reduce uh, the validation effort across uh, the different vendor IP and DPU. Because uh, now if we have the common API, we can try to make the common validation model. Yeah. And we need a portable software stack, actually. Yeah. That's why that we're spending time to uh, uh, focus on the open programming infrastructure project. Actually, I'm working on the another committee called uh, IOM Global Forum. Through the discussion in the IOM Global Forum, we will focus on the desired computing infrastructure. Yeah, actually the same issue we, we feel that uh, we need the common API to deploy DPU and IPU. So IOM Global Forum is not software committee, so we are aligned to the, this open forum infrastructure project. We are tracking the status of the software deployment through the, the 
open primary infrastructure project. Once it's a stable API, we try to adapt, actually. Yeah. So the goal of the uh, OPI is here I listed, yeah, first the community-driven standard-based open ecosystem, and then the analyst framework and the architecture. This is a very important thing. And that's why the, we are now working under the Linux Foundation for the open source project. And to define the new API and the standard where we need it. And but uh, you know, more important thing, we have to reuse the existing source, open source and API if this exists. So for example, the, we are adapting the open telemetry uh, community project to adapt and uh, when we monitor, uh, focus on the monitor telemetry, we have to collaborate with that community project. And also once we develop, of course we need to show that the implementation example and the reference case. That's probably we need to collaborate as a uh, community outside of the software community because there are many uh, community to discuss that uh, new type of the, uh, architecture so we can collaborate like uh, Ion Global Forum. They can probably, probably promote the, this API implementation. Yeah. We have to expand the uh, more cross-industry community collaboration. Anyway, so we plan to reduce the variation across, uh, variation across the implementation. There are many types of the implementation way so we try to do that the common approach first, and also created the standard API, and uh, we use the uh, API that already used on the existing CPU because it, uh, no, we just run the uh, processor inside the DPU and IPU. For example, we can implement the Kubernetes inside the DPU and IPU. To be honest, yeah, and also. Uh, we do the best practice, uh, no step by step. Uh, when the uh, code is ready, we do the POC and uh, show the uh, feasibility every time, every year. So not one, uh, uh, just once, okay? We do the repeatedly, like a DevOps model, okay? And focus on the DPIP side, yeah. Why not uh, 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 focus on upper side? The upper side already have the lots of the ecosystem. We can align to that ecosystem, yeah. Once we are ready for the open API, a common API, yeah, we can collaborate with the other community that are learning on the uh, existing Kubernetes community. So, so here is a uh, working group we are uh, establishing. The first provision that the lifecycle working group uh, focus on that uh, uh, device discovery model and zero type provision model, and also boot sequencing. Yeah, actually, yeah, you see that the uh, open telemetry we are doing, uh, we are following the uh, monitoring telemetry uh, framework into the uh, open telemetry. And also, regarding zero touch project, we adapted the uh, SGTP, GTP, with the secure GTP. And uh, uh, regarding the API workload, uh, working group, uh, yeah, we are now working on the IP structure now for the Network workload, stage workload, security workload, okay, there are many uh, no, various uh, workload and uh, various API there. So we try to create a simulator of the API simulator for each uh, functionality. And uh, also the, uh, in order to do the POC, we are preparing the uh, POC environment under the developer platform working group. And then the, uh, also we are the, uh, talking about uh, use case, and uh, that actually this is a main uh, a point what I, uh, after the, uh, this uh, brief interaction, I'd like to discuss with you guys about what use case you are expecting to, that, uh, to DP and IPU. So far, uh, uh, we, know, uh, we know that uh, NVMe over public is one of the use case, and also basic firewall uh, is also Another use case, and that was actually uh, entity that I have planned to share the IO implementation use case uh, next month at the use case working group in the OPI project. Actually, yeah, there are many uh, opportunities to uh, learn that the what the use case is uh, uh, common into the uh, OPI project. Yeah, yeah. Here is a uh, example of uh, the current uh, ongoing status, and uh, in the the, uh, probably in the life cycle working group, uh, yeah, we are doing the, the discovery and the provisioning and also inventory management, both sequence and uh, monitoring and temporary uh, work. 
on the life cycle and update. Actually, yeah, uh, when we discuss the life cycle of DPIP, uh, yeah, that's one issue. So, so we have to have the common model of the, how to manage life cycle of DPU and IPU. Separate from the existing x86, because of the, uh, for the service provider side, when we deploy the, the infrastructure, okay, no one likes to impact the uh, maintenance uh, to the uh, users' uh, workload. We, if we separate the tenant workload and infrastructure uh, uh, cluster, uh, it might be possible to not impact the maintenance issue to the uh, guest user. So we try to think about how we can manage life cycle uh, independently for the DPI and IP. Uh, so far, uh, uh, OPI adopted the uh, secure zero touch projecting and uh, also adopting the open telemetry and also uh, system managed BIOS uh, uh, we are adopting actually. So uh, you see that uh, we, we don't make the new thing actually. Uh, if we, uh, technology is there, we try to adopt that technology. And we try to find that the, what is a missing feature. Uh, we have to spend time to develop anyway. So here is a, a API a working group a status. And uh, actually, that uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, you see that the, this diagram, and uh, you see that the uh, simulator API. We try to create uh, each similar API for network and storage and security and AI machine learning. Yeah, there are many. Uh, this is based on the use case, and uh, yeah, sometimes I, uh, I get a require uh, inquiry from the uh, partner, the customer, and uh, whether the, uh, the uh, how uh, P4 uh, framework can be integrated in the uh, network uh, workload. Actually, this is uh, under discussion, and we are also targeting. And uh, for example, the uh, yeah, here uh, we are now also adapting that OBS and Open Config and the PPP here. And uh, yeah, so you can find that the GitHub and the what uh, the, to check that the state each of the status. And uh, uh, we are now planning the March Pender uh, Laboratory, uh, targeting the uh, University of New Hampshire. UNH, yeah, we are trying to create that uh, lab. But uh, actually, uh, separated uh, each member and each part of each user is now preparing the each test and uh, started to uh, prepare the park uh, to show that uh, feasibility, actually. So you can also find that the uh, uh, GitHub uh, or the, uh, what uh, uh, diagram you can pre uh, prepare for the OPI park, yeah. And then that, uh, uh, this is the main part that uh, I like to, we like to spend time to discuss the use case. Uh, this is, yeah, and I hand over the uh, uh, F5, and uh, he can talk about that, uh, what use case uh, any, uh, F5 is expecting and uh, what status of the use case we are now discussing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you have any questions at this point? <laughs> no? I hope you understand what DPU is uh, now. If you don't, uh, I might want to go back to it and explain in basics what it is. So, uh, show of hands, uh, who knows DPU by now? One, two, kind of, kind of, kind of. I'll, I'll go back and talk a little bit about it. So, the most important thing I want you guys to know is that this uh, DPU technology is actually the uh, technology that allows a private cloud to be scaled and managed independent of the host applications. So uh, it has the trust boundary between the host and the PCIe card. DPU, IPU, sometimes we call it XPU, it is a PCIe card that plugs into the host. And as uh, Hyde mentioned, it can be managed independent of the host. So it has the BMC controller, uh, the base board management controller chip on the PCI card itself. There's the same BMC on the host itself. So the host and the card gets booted and provisioned and deployed in the, independently. So what we can do is, for example, uh, use the uh, resources on the DPU card to mul do multiple things. So the use cases that it will support uh, initially will be networking, storage, security, 
Can you go back up? Mm -hmm. I forgot which one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, storage, security, networking, AI, ML. So there are three, four, five vendors uh, developing DPU cards, and all those vendors may have different forms of hardware accelerations. So one of the key things that this uh, OPI work group is trying to do is standardize a common API so that let's say you want an accelerated storage access or you want an accelerated networking as an infrastructure service or platform service. You don't want to be you know, uh, building or compiling or integrating a NIC card driver every time you change a card. So what this uh, initiative does is help build a API, a common API that abstracts the use cases that allows a user of this uh, platform to define what they want to accelerate on the DPU without having have to do some deep integration of per vendor uh, hardware resources. So the hardware resources could be like a Topino chip, it could be a FPGA or a vendor specific uh, programmable uh, ASIC, et cetera. But uh, the users uh, should not care about what the underlying hardware is. So the important thing that this uh, OPI uh, initiative is trying to do is define a common API, define common ways of provisioning such that you can enjoy the benefits of infrastructure workloads being accelerated in hardware with more efficient resources like ARM cores, which is the base uh, processing unit on most of the DP vendors. So uh, and that, those are the uh, basics that uh, I want you guys to take away today. And a few things about NVMe and basic firewall. These are the uh, initial use cases that the work group is uh, trying to define or build POCs or build demo environments. But if any of you in this room have, or anyone online, have any use cases that you are interested in, please uh, do speak up. Uh, the forum is open to anyone uh, who has interest so that uh, you can contribute by requesting or recommending a certain use case that you are interested in. So, uh, slide four. yeah. So, uh, I might have verbally went through all of these, but uh, there are the BMC on the host, as you can see, and on the XPU, it's the abbreviations of, uh, abbreviation of DPU or IPU. DPU stands for Data Center Processing Unit, or IPU stands for Infrastructure Processing Unit. Uh, it's, it might be easier to just call them XPU because there are so many variations. But here, uh, the BMC is the one that manages the board, and uh, as you can see, it could be ARM or MIPS cores, but many of the uh, uh, available or uh, row mapped uh, ven vendor products uh, do uh, target ARM as the uh, processing unit. The, uh, there tends to be a networking acceleration using P4 pipelines. Uh, some of them use the Tofino chip, some of them use P4 as the abstraction layer to uh, program their own uh, hardware chips, and uh, there's many other uh, accelerators like uh, uh, doing encryption or GPUs or AIML, FPGA, uh, acceler accelerating regular expressions, and uh, of course, the storage controller. Next slide. So, uh, I think this is kind of a repeat of the other slide, but uh, the uh, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, NVMe uh, use case. So uh, NVMe, as you know, it evolves the SCSI type of access where SCSI has a single queue, uh, but this NVMe can uh, parallelize the access. Now, uh, if you have this DPU card, what can you do? So uh, let's say you have local uh, storage. Local storage could be uh, accessed by, of course, the uh, uh, NVMe over PCIe from this DPU card, but this card can also act as a bridge between the networked uh, uh, storage. Uh, so let's say you have a fa uh, fabric of storage networks. Uh, this car can access the network over Ethernet, but it can also access the uh, storage infrastructure within the host itself. So it could manage uh, both worlds being the bridge to uh, address some of your uh, application demands that would require storage access, lower latency storage access, highly scalable storage access, 
So that's one of the uh, first things that we're looking at. And the second thing we're looking at, of course, is that this uh, card is the entry point into your host applications. So doing security, basic security, would be uh, the other use case that uh, we are focused on. Initially, we will probably do some basic firewalling, as, as, as shown in the previous slide. But uh, uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, this is the sideway view of the other uh, diagrams that you've seen before. Uh, the other diagram you saw from Hyde was that there was the host application on the top and DP on the bottom, and there was the red line in between. So this time the red line is between the left side and the right side. Left side is the DPU, right side is the host application. So when there's traffic coming into the DPU, you would want to do basic security without impacting the host applications. So what makes sense probably would be to do some basic firewalling or maybe do layer 4 DDoS mitigations so that your applications are not impacted your application, we don't want your application CPUs to be impacted by infrastructure workloads. So that's why you would separate that from the host application, I put it on the uh, card itself, and uh, do uh, basic security. So uh, this actually talks about uh, service provider use case, although uh, not, not limited to service provider use case. This uh, actually talks about a 5G core use case. So uh, 5G core, uh, as some of you may or may not know, uh, from uh, 3G days to 4G days, it has evolved uh, towards a service-based architecture, and 5G core actually uses uh, HTTP2 protocols. Now, uh, those will be scaled in Kubernetes environments, but uh, we don't want those uh, 5G core elements to be impacted by network workloads, because uh, let's say you want to uh, you know, open up a web page or start an application, you want a minimal latency for setting up a data path from the smartphone uh, to the uh, core network. So you want minimum latency without being impacted by any uh, other type of uh, infrastructure uh, workload uh, on the host itself. So uh, we would uh, separate that workload, put it on the DPU, and let it do ingress control, egress control. Uh, egress control is more of uh, defining where the workload shall go and is allowed to go, for example. So uh, let's say you have a IoT device out there. The IoT device could only access, let's say, your uh, application controller server or something, and it's not meant to access general internet. So the egress control would actually secure the IoT infrastructure by uh, defining uh, the ingress, but also defining the egress so that the application stays within the uh, trust zone or the trust domain. So uh, those are uh, applications that allow managed services for service provider environments. Uh, that actually leads to the mini point that I've written there. Uh, it's called 5G slicing, where the 5G radio has defined a way of slicing the infrastructure to do multiple layers of services. Uh, we can consume that slice and make sure that there's a uh, ZTNA, uh, zero trust network access type of environment for specific uh, device applications and make sure that this DPU allocates a specific trust domain and only allows access to certain uh, microservice workloads. So uh, those are just you know, common or uh, modern day examples of what uh, service providers around the world are looking into. But it's not limited to service providers. This DPU technology is actually somewhat similar to the foundational technology that uh, the hyperscalers have uh, adopted. So the hyperscalers meaning Google, uh, AWS. Uh, you may have read the AWS Nitro. It is a good uh, example of how you separate the host workload from the card. And the card itself actually controls the host itself, uh, does the network uh, management, storage management. And let's say the host application uh, hands, for example. The uh, controller PCI card sends the interrupt to the uh, host so that it can create a core dump. And it, it does have some thin layer of hypervisor on the host itself so that it can you know, uh, consume the uh, interrupts, et cetera. But uh, those are just common examples of how you build your, your private cloud or cloud infrastructure for uh, the uh, maybe medium to large enterprise uh, audiences. So uh, let me 
kind of paused at this point and do you now understand what DP is? Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not a question, right? <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. I'm hoping that you understand what DPU is uh, in a way better than like 10 minutes ago. Uh, so, uh, okay. Uh, is, we have a lot of time, so I just want the audience to speak up. Uh, does anyone have any specific use cases that, or use case that they are interested in that you want to discuss here? Because it, we have an opportunity, very small crowd, uh, maybe anyone online can ask, but uh, does anyone want to uh, raise a topic around use case? Hi, sorry. Okay. Yeah, so um, I think for us, we're, we're mostly looking at um, using a, a, a DPU to, or previously a smart NIC to provide um, to provide things like tenant isolation tenant for uh, for on-prem private cloud mm -hmm. um, and things like like we would like to be able to run some network processes on it like for example like a routing agent like FRR or BERT or, or something similar mm -hmm. and um, and to have that be isolated from the from the actual bare metal system itself mm -hmm. I think that's for yeah so for us that's probably how we see um, how we see ourselves using um, DPU and I've kind of looked a little into it. So yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with your presentation and I think you've, you've kind of explained it very well on, on what uh, a DPU can, uh, can help us. Thank you. Uh, yeah. If, if yeah, it's okay, uh, can you, uh, yeah, you know, what, what is your name? And oh, sorry. <laughs> I, um, yeah, so my name is Derek. I'm from Rakuten. Okay. Yep. So, yep. <laughs> very interesting. Yeah, please. please, please. Uh, uh, further information I, I, in this slide, uh, you can see that the, uh, actually, yeah, open system can cover the, it's maybe we can say that the converged cluster. It's actually in this diagram, based on this diagram, we just uh, run the, the Kumas uh, cluster to cover the, the DPU and the user's tenant uh, cluster. But uh, actually, uh, more, furthermore, we can actually uh, separate the Kubernetes cluster, one for the, the uh, user run, the other for the DPU cluster, actually. We can install two type of the Kubernetes workflow in case of the OpenShift, actually. They're running on the uh, ARM-based OpenShift, and the other is running on the x86 based uh, uh, OpenShift. And the challenge is that the, uh, we have a two type of controller in that case, the OpenShift, ARM-based OpenShift controller, and the x86 based open shift controller. So we have to manage the much architecture cluster. So actually the other another project we called HyperShift uh, to run the uh, multiple uh, architecture controller on top of the uh, Qbot actually. Yeah, we are working on that. But uh, uh, what I'm uh, saying that the furthermore actually we can isolate the uh, administrator, one for DPU, uh, infrastructure and the other for the x86 infrastructure. That is another example where what we are doing. Good, good. So um, I'm from F5, so I'd like to pitch my product solution as well, but I'm not doing that today. But uh, this is a good way of uh, managing a multi cluster environment. I do agree because uh, a cluster may only have 100 nodes in a cluster. And if you look at the uh, scale of a uh, network like Rakuten, for example, they have a very high scalable uh, Kubernetes infrastructure. And in order to manage those uh, private cloud high scale infrastructures, you would need to control where the traffic goes and where the traffic comes back to. And a service that manages the ingress and the egress aspects of those will be very critical in a multi-cluster environment. So uh, this has a lot of potential in doing that. And the best part about it is that the OPI project is trying to uh, abstract the use cases and make sure that your uh, vendor selection uh, doesn't impact your integrations. So that is a very critical in how, how we are targeting the uh, APIs and the deployment models of uh, OPI projects. So uh, maybe we wanna go to the next slide. So uh, a bit of repeat on uh, how the OPI 
project is structured. So we have uh, a steering committee, of course, and board of directors. Uh, there's the outreach community doing these type of marketing efforts. But uh, we do have some uh, independent work groups running uh, weekly or biweekly meetings. The provisioning and life cycle API. API is very critical. We are developing APIs. Developer platform is also very important, but use case is one of the most important because we want this to be useful, of course. So, next slide. And, yeah, so uh, I think this is the... Yes, so uh, this is uh, basically the last slide. Uh, we have like 10 minutes <laughs> left, so uh, oh, get... Uh, uh, yeah, so... Uh, the slides are available uh, online uh, in PDF form, so you don't need to take pictures, if, but you can take pictures yeah, if you, you want. Yeah, you can scan the picture mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. to, if we When you mm -hmm. uh, join the mailing list, yeah, and also when you add uh, join that Slack, so we have a Slack to discuss the many uh, per each uh, working group. So it's better for you to join the Slack when you have any question we discuss. It's better to easy to co interact to communication. Anyway. And uh, I believe it was last month or so, there was KubeCon in Detroit, Michigan. They were also talking about an enterprise customer, uh, an enterprise uh, talking about the importance of IPU, DPU. You might want to look up KubeCon and see uh, what a certain enterprise is thinking about in terms of requirements for IPU, DPU environment. So that was a very interesting uh, perspective. I'm from the vendor side, but it would be interesting if you look at the you know, a user side of uh, why they want DPUs and IPUs. So there's a session from KubeCon that will be very interesting. It's not linked here, but uh, for FYI. Okay. So, uh, any question? Questions, comments? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. if you don't mind, please state your name and where you're from. Yes. Yoshida from Kyokushia Corporation. I am is the CEO. Vendor. Mm. Vendor. Mm. And we are also doing NVMe over fabric. And VME over Street. fabric, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Very so, important. Yeah, so we are interested in the mm. NVMe mm. bridge. Bridge, yes, 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 yes. So is that a ship bridge that converts NVMe over PCIe to NVMe over Ethernet? Say. TGB or are you going to talk about the intelligent life of the nitro car that's why EBS was something virtualization of computation of this. So, uh, uh, I understand your question. Uh, thank you for the interest in the NBO, NBME over fabric use case and the bridge he's interested in. And the question was uh, related to, uh, is it similar to how Nitro defines the uh, storage access on the Nitro card? Uh, I'm not the right one to answer that question, so maybe I can answer, but uh, there is a forum that you can join and you can you know, uh, look up Slack and un understand what they're discussing. I, I, do not know the actual details of the or the progress of it, but it is one of the uh, key uh, use cases that the project is uh, looking into. So actually, the further uh, activity actually outside the OPI, but uh, uh, in the IO global form, we can try to establish the NV over fabric over the all public network that the IO provide. So I think that Kyosha is one of the members, so we can discuss further. <laughs> Yeah, Thank there's you. Uh, many uh, solutions. You adapting the OPI technology and uh, mm -hmm. in the other uh, photonic network technology, actually. Yeah, we have. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. And we do accept questions in Japanese if you want. Uh, I'll translate that for you if you prefer to ask in Japanese by any chance. Uh, hi, um, Derek from Rakuten again. Mm -hmm. Um, my next question is: I want I want to ask, like, what ki what kind of operating systems run on this um, this uh, D DPUs? Like, is it a specific form of embedded Linux, or can 
can we put something generic like Debian or something on it? <laughs> so, uh, of course, Red Hat Linux is ready, but uh, any, uh, anything that runs on uh, ARM core, yes. So, yeah, uh, this would ARM, yeah. We yeah. can implement, and uh, also we can implement the Kubernetes, uh, for example, OpenShift control platform is available in the ARM uh, uh, processor. So uh, I'm from the independent software vendor side. Uh, we have uh, some challenges in porting certain applications to ARM workloads. So we, uh, for example, my company F5, those have a number of software and applications, but not all of them run on ARM. So uh, um, there is a challenge in uh, not just the operating system part, but the application readiness for the specific use cases. There are uh, certain milestones that we have not hit yet. But uh, as you mentioned, uh, it can run uh, any Linux operating system. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't have to be a, a specific uh, one. But uh, uh, we will be running POCs uh, with uh, Red Hat NSX, for example, because those are the, one of the uh, strongest contributors to the forum. So uh, there may be phases in who does it first. And one of the key aspects of this uh, project is that uh, it will target to do uh, qualifications or certifications of compliance to the uh, standards. So uh, we should be you know, excited about that because it, regardless of what the operating system is, the host or the uh, application user or the cloud platform user uh, doesn't need to worry about how that works out. So there are uh, talks about using real-time OS, et cetera, and doing some uh, telco type of workflows on that system so that we do uh, precision timing of it. All right, thank you very much. Questions? Okay, uh, if you have any further question, uh, please let me know. We can discuss offline also. And uh, also, uh, you can join the uh, slacks and to discuss and through the chat. Yeah, each working group uh, member uh, is uh, yeah, very happy to discuss with you guys. And, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you for paying attention. Thank you. Thank you.